I do see some new faces I have not yet met. Um, so let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Alice Mong, Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center. And it is a great pleasure for us to be um, kind of co-presenting tonight's program uh, with Global Heritage Fund, our friends from San Francisco. And it is really a delight uh, for us to be um, to, to really play host. Uh, we've been in discussion for a couple of months now, and, uh, and tonight's panel is uh, full of friends, and in fact, some new friends. And we're delighted uh, to have the opportunity to do, uh, present this topic, uh, talking about role of NGOs in cultural heritage conservation in mainland China and Hong Kong. And those of you who know uh, a bit about Asia Society Hong Kong and know our site, uh, where we are, we're in the Jockey Club Hall. This building is new, but you know uh, Asia Society Hong Kong Center. We are um, uh, kind of a part of Hong Kong's um, heritage site. This is the uh, second oldest colonial building in Hong Kong is located here and, and my, where my office is. And uh, so those of you who have not had an opportunity to tour this center, um, uh, I'm happy to take people on a tour after uh, tonight's uh, program or come back anytime. I'd be happy to show it to you. And also the story of our um, uh, preservation and some of the history is presented in a book called Heritage Reveal, and it's available uh, in our bookstore. And really, we are celebrating, we will be celebrating five-year anniversary, um, February of 2017. And we're really delighted that in this five-year time, um, this center has gone from strength to strength. We now, um, in fact, uh, for my we were doing some uh, research, and some of the things that we've been able to do is we've been able to present some wonderful exhibitions, including the current exhibition that's uh, in the Chantel Miller Gallery called Picturing Asia, uh, presenting two Magnum photographers um, and their photos of Asia from 1950s around 1950s till about 1990s. So those are wonderful exhibitions. And, I, and you, you were all given a ticket to see the exhibition. So please come back and see the exhibition. And in this five years time, we have welcomed uh, almost um, uh, over 250,000 visitors and have done about 13, about 14 exhibitions. And we're really delighted. Um, the government gave us this uh, site, a 21 year lease. And uh, we still have 10 years to go, and we promised the government that we would open up the site to the public. And tonight's program um, is really one of the examples of the programs that we here, uh, Asia Society, are able to do. We do about 200 programs a year, um, and 60% of them have been in the arts and cultural space, which is something that we had previously not been able to present before when we did not have our own home. So this is our role. This is Asia Society Hong Kong's role um, of raising the money, fixing it up, and really building this new um, new building to connect the historical site. And so we're delighted um, that you know other organizations are doing similar, but on a bigger scale. And I think that's one of the reasons um, we're really, we understand that we have a, a partner here in, with the Global Heritage Fund. They now have established themselves here in Hong Kong, and so we're really uh, delighted to welcome them uh, to Hong Kong. And I think for those of you who know that Global Heritage Fund is an international cons conservancy based in San Francisco, California, and uh, our Asia Society colleague in San Francisco, uh, many of them uh, are, are friends of um, GHF, so we're really delighted um, that uh, Stephen Portman, the executive director of GHF, can be with us, and we're, I'm going to pass the mic to him in a little bit. Uh, the organization was founded in 2002 with a focus on sustainable preservation of rural heritage sites in developing regions. And to date, I think GHF has worked in, uh, on almost three, 30 projects in 20 countries and is a registered nonprofit in the United States, UK, and Hong Kong. Um, Stephen Portman is the executive director, as I mentioned. Uh, Stephen is responsible for the executive management, operation, and strategic direction of GHF, and he is also a member of the board of trustee of GHF US, GHF UK, GHF Hong Kong, and he has a master's degree of, of, with honors in economics from the University of of Edinburgh in Scotland, and he has over 18 years in the nonprofit sector and 11 years working in the heritage preservation in, uh, industry. So it's my great honor to welcome Sivan Portman to the SAM. Thank you, Sivan. Good evening, everyone. Um, it, on behalf of Global Heritage Fund, I would like to thank the Asia Society, particularly Alice and her team, for welcoming us, welcoming us here tonight. Um, to speak a little bit about our work. 
uh, in Asia and to talk uh, more specifically about our work in China. I um, am going to give a very brief overview on Global Heritage Fund and some of our work to date before I hand over to my colleague, Quan Hong Lee, uh, who is our China Heritage Director, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about the work that we have been doing in China in the last few years. Um, as Alice mentioned, we were founded in 2002. Our mission is the sustainable preservation of world heritage sites. Um, the UNESCO list of world heritage sites is now over 1,000 in number. Uh, while UNESCO does manage and maintain the list, uh, oftentimes uh, inscription does not mean increased funding from state parties or the UNESCO system or the UN system for preservation. Fundamentally, Global Heritage Fund believes that heritage sites are assets, social, cultural, and political assets that can be used for benefit of local communities, regions, and states. GHF's focus to date, uh, our, our fundraising to date, has been predominantly in the U.S. and the U.K. We've raised almost $50 million since 2002 and we've raised another $50 million in co-funding in country around the world. As Alice mentioned, we are a registered nonprofit in the US, the UK, and now in Hong Kong. Our methodology is uh, one that we like to call preservation by design. It's an integrated methodology that involves four core focal areas. Planning, which can involve master planning, management planning, conservation planning, physical conservation of the monuments, community development, involvement of local communities we believe is key to long-term success and sustainable preservation, and finally, strategic partnerships, both with civil society, private sector, and national governments. Heritage around the world is under threat, as we are all well aware from events that we witness in the Middle East to tragic uh, natural disasters in places like Nepal, where we saw an earthquake last year. Heritage is threatened by a variety of man-made and natural forces, uh, including in that are unsustainable tourism, unplanned development, and a lack of um, national resources. Global Heritage Fund over the last 15 years has um, adapted our site selection criteria to focus on uh, a number of criteria that we deem important to long-term success. Obviously, a site must be significant, world heritage either inscribed or have the potential to be world heritage, it must be endangered, there must be strong leadership at the site, this is, we, we believe, key to long-term success, and there must be community development opportunities that exist around the site. Our impact can be seen on a variety of levels related to both site preservation and community. Our benefits are both quantitative and qualitative in nature. Uh, included in that are stability of physical structures, management of sites, as well as jobs and income for communities and public-private partnerships. I'm very briefly going to give an overview of some of the sites that GHF has worked on in Asia to date. My colleague, as I mentioned, Han Lee, will focus on the three sites where we have most recently been involved in China, so I'll give a very brief overview on the others. Many of people here are aware of Li Jiang. Uh, it was our first project in China in 2003. Uh, we worked with the government on the development of a management plan and conservation plan, and we funded a heritage and commerce plan as well. Together with the local and national government, we set up a community investment program whereby Global Heritage Fund and homeowners and the national government all contributed one-third of the financial resources to preserve almost 400 structures. Foguang Temple in Shaanxi province, a uh, very significant site in the Wutai Mountains. Global Heritage Fund collaborated with the national government in China on the development of a master conservation plan for the site, provided emergency support, for certain conservation that was affected by flooding and also supported the conservation of a very important pagoda. Ping Yao in Shangxi, I'm going to uh, let my colleague Han Li speak about the last uh, 
probably uh, an intact walled city also in Shaanxi in China. Guizhou in China, where we're working in uh, Dali. It's a minority Dong village. Misan in Vietnam is a Champa Kingdom site in central Vietnam, dating from the 8th to 10th century. Global Heritage Fund support provided mapping of buildings and destruction to the site, including threats and conservation needs. We provided conservation support for the E and G groups of the monuments, and also on a community development level, developed a book with UNESCO, UNESCO Bangkok called World Heritage in Young Hands that was disseminated to many local schools, helping them to understand the value of heritage at a young age. Wat Bu in southern Laos is a Hindu complex temple. GHF provided conservation planning and conservation of Nandin Hall, an important structure on the site, as well as training and capacity building for stonemasons and the restoration of a community library. Hampi in India is located in Karnataka. This site involves almost 500 monuments spread over 26 square kilometers. In partnership with the state government of Karnataka and the Hampi Foundation, Global Heritage Fund funded the conservation of the Chandramashwalar Temple and trained stone craftsmen and stone masons in conservation techniques. Banta Chamar in Cambodia was built by Jayavarman VII, who is also known for building Angkor. This is a satellite temple located about 150 kilometers northwest of Angkor. The face towers that are well known at the Bayan were actually um, first constructed at Banta Chamar. Uh, we worked very closely with the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts on the restoration of several face towers, as well as the conservation of um, the bas-reliefs on the south and eastern walls of the site. Perhaps most importantly, Global Heritage Fund worked to establish a community-based tourism organization with the local community so that they could not only benefit from, but also manage the tourism coming to the site. More recently, Global Heritage Fund has developed a relationship with the Yangon Heritage Trust in Myanmar that is focused on the preservation of colonial buildings in downtown Yangon. These buildings are threatened by urban development, encroachment, and a host of legal issues. New GHF investigations in Asia include the Amer Fort in Rajasthan, Maiji Shan, a site that my colleague Han Lee will speak about in more detail, and Patan Durbar Square, which was affected by the earthquake in April of last year in Nepal. So in the last two years, Global Heritage Fund has been working to establish a nonprofit entity here in Hong Kong. And the reasons for that are several. We would like to deepen and expand our expertise here in the region. We would like to be able to leverage uh, private, increased private to support, to leverage increased public funding. I'd like to now hand over to my colleague Han Lee. Han is, uh, has a degree in architecture from the National University of Singapore. She has a graduate degree in preservation from the University of Pennsylvania in the United States and is working at her PhD in conservation at Peking University in Beijing. Han has been working with Global Heritage Fund since 2008 and leads our projects and programs in China. Thank you very much. Hello, good evening. Thank you for coming here. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Quan Han Li. Um, as Stefan has said, I am the project director for China for Global Heritage Fund. Um, so today I'm here really to share my experience of working as um, a representative of, of international NGO working in China on conservation. Um, as we all realize, uh, or as many of you know, China has a very different, mainland China has a very different political and social climate. 
and, and, and the rules of working as an NGO is, is quite different from Hong Kong. So um, I'm not here, I'm just here to share my experience. It's been a great learning curve, great learning experience for the past eight years. Um, and specifically, I will talk about three projects that I personally am very involved in for the past eight years and how we came about doing what we do. So just very briefly, so obviously when we talk about conservation, when we think about heritage, uh, we like to think about very grand monumental stuff. Um, I'm not going to list like most of this. And, and, you know, and usually when we talk about a monumental site, they're very much um, what, we, what we call a top-down approach. So it's very much from the government-driven, uh, the state has a whole of it, and because they're very expensive, they're very specific, very technical. So it, it's, it's kind of, um, we wonder where does an NGO actually has a role in, in conservations like that. Um, and then also, you know, over the years, um, the feel of heritage itself, the concept about heritage has also evolved. So, you know, we talk about, you know, things that we used to think they are very vernacular, things that are just kind of common in our daily life. It could be historic houses, historic city, rural villages that we don't usually associate them as, as a monument. You know, they are also becoming heritage. And because they're fast disappearing, for instance, in China, because of globalization and rapid urbanization. So we start to realize how, how fragile, how vulnerable and, and they are. So we're paying attention to them. And I think, that, so from my example that I'm going to talk about today, so we can see really it's in this kind of heritage site where there's a living community where they will continue to use and occupy, you know, this heritage site. So, you know, how do they, how are they going to maintain the history in the present and moving on for the future? And this is really where a role of an NGO really plays a part in, in conservation of sites like that. Um, so just a very brief introduction of locations of um, where GHF has worked. So uh, you can see those in gray. The are sites that we have worked at, we have worked at, at before, or actually we have done investigation um, that, you know, still under investigation that we might not have carried out full-fledged uh, project. And then those, they are actually highlighted in black. So that's actually the current ongoing project. So you can see there's quite a wide spectrum. So from north, south, east, west. So it's a, it's a range of um, conservation projects in, in China that we're interested in. Um, I just talk a little bit about our strategy uh, working in, Hong, uh, in China. So basically, uh, we're not a big organization, and conservation projects can be very tedious, very, uh, very long, very expensive, very technical. So basically, what we try to achieve as an as a NGO is, you know, we're not going to go in and say we're going to pay for all the conservation restoration work, and then once our funding runs out, once we leave, that's, you know, that's going to leave it dry. So basically, we let the state government China, as uh, many of you know now, the state government actually they do have the funding for it to do the hardware, you know, the heavy lifting, the actual conservation work. And then what we do is we put in seed money in many sense. For instance, we will fund the uh, initial study, we will fund the conservation plan, the management plan, which will lead to a series of action once it's approved by the government so they can actually put in the money to implement the vision. So that's why I call it the multiplier effect. And then with China now, a lot of people talk about how, you know, with this growing economy, why do they need money? Why do they need NGO? Because what we realize in China, there's a very uneven distribution of resources in the country. So you have Beijing, you have Shanghai, and then we work in one of the poorest areas where we talk about in rural villages, in, in Guizhou, in Southwest. You know, even when they have the money from the central government, they, they've always been lacking behind human resources. They don't even know how to best manage and how to implement that kind of funding. So this is really where we come in. So it's kind of a we're there to, it's a supplementary approach. And then we work on projects where the government funding cannot be applied to. And a lot of them are community-based. Um, so this is really where we come in as an NGO and is our value added of it. And then also we don't just look at heritage as material, as just stones and wood. So it is really aligned with a lot of very core issues that, yeah, they, that align with national policy or just social um, core issues like, you know, urban regeneration, uh, rural transformation, ethnic pride integration. It touches on a lot of things. Um, so I'll talk about this using case studies. So the first project I'll talk about is Pingyao, uh, as Stefan has briefly introduced. So this is just to give you an idea of, of how the city, so it's a walled city. Um, so it's actually the most well-preserved walled city in China now. It's a World Heritage Site in 1997. 
And uh, the city wall itself, the, it's a remain of from 14th century. And inside the city is actually uh, mostly, I would say, courtyard houses, traditional courtyard houses that actually dated from mostly 17th to early 20th century. Um, that's about uh, 3,900 of them that remains in, in, inside the city, along with all the other monuments. So right in the beginning, when we worked there, you know, we, we don't quite to understand what the context is. So we think of it as city wall, as the temples, as all these national monuments. But we're quickly to realize that um, this is how like, they have very fancy hotel now. So most of you who go to Pingyao, you'll probably see the commercial street and, and the nice development. But we start to realize most of the, I would say 80% or more than that, of the courtyard houses in the city, once you go off the commercial street, they actually look like that. Um, they are still occupied by native. Uh, they're native from Pingyao. And they're living in conditions, if it gets very cold, so they're still burning coal. They don't have flush toilets. They don't have um, proper sewage. And this is when we realized that, you know, probably our focus is not on the monument. It has to be on these historic houses. Um, and, 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 and also it has to deal with how the people who are living in the historic houses, you know, how are you going to enable them to be able to preserve and maintain them in the future? Um, so this is just a summary of what we have done. So you can see we have a shift in, in our, our thinking. So we started off with like a master plan, so the grand vision for the city. We work with Shanghai Tongji University on that. Um, and then we thought about doing, um, you know, model courtyard restoration project. Um, and then we converted it into a community cultural center where the local were using it for weekly lecture. And then slowly we developed this program where something has to be more sustainable with a wider impact. So with the municipality, um, we replicated this um, success from Lijiang, so on the Historic Courtyard Incentive Fund. So it's a small scale project. So basically every year they will pick about 30 courtyards that qualify uh, certain selection criteria. And then the government will help to subsidize maybe 50 or 60% of the restoration fund. And then the, the owners themselves have to put in the others. And then the thing is, it's, it's, it's a flexible program because, you know, the thing is, the government will have experts, they will have provide technical experts, um, the part funding to kind of restore the courtyard and structure-wise. But then it's up to the owners because it's are private houses, you know, how they want to renovate it, how they want it to look. As long as the integrity is there, it's basically a, a, a true private-public partnership in that sense. So um, I'll just give you a few examples. So this is actually the first uh, model uh, courtyard project that we did. Um, so that was before and after, and then they were running the lecture. And this, when, this is the project when we kind of realized it's not going to be sustainable because this was actually a government partnership. It was a government-owned project, and then we ran into a problem of ownership where historically it belonged to a private owner, the ancestor, you know, so their descendant came by, there was a whole dispute. So we realized we really have to focus on working and enabling current private homeowners on how to uh, maintain their courtyards. So this is the one example of this program. So this is how it looked like before. So the owner, he has, um, he wants to move to the new city, but his mother wants to live in the old courtyard house. So he doesn't know what to do with it. So he applied for the funding to improve it. This is, this is what the government public fund does. So if it kind of restores the structure. And then um, this is what the owner, so everything else is decorative and that's amenity. That is the owner's own money. So he doesn't touch the structure but he wanted to convert the spare spaces into a guest house while his mother still live in it. So he put in a new bathroom, he put in a new kitchen, and he's making spare cash at the site. So it's kind of a solution for him of what to do with this, you know, kind of, um, you know, something that he didn't value and, he doesn't, and it's kind of broken that he didn't want to live, into it, uh, live in it. So this is another example. That was a commercial conversion. Uh, and then this is uh, just uh, another courtyard house. So we talk to the owner. They don't want to convert into something fancy because they don't have a lot of money. So they just they also want to retain it for residential use. So this is a very this was before, and this is after. It's very modest. You can almost tell the difference. But we did the whole roof so it doesn't it doesn't leak anymore. We remove some of the uh, concrete facing. Um, Same this is before. This is after. So we put in some. Uh, new um, wooden decorative elements at their request, all the rules were redone. So in the end, what happened with this program is that instead of the idea of, you know, in the, in the restoration program, all the courtyard houses are going to look the same. In fact, we have done 63 courtyard houses so far. Every house will be a little bit different 
finish. And it's because it depends on the willingness um, of the residents, on their personal aesthetic, and then also on their capacity to pay. And, 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 and so it's actually a very diverse. So you cannot maintain this characteristic of you know, this evolving vernacular architecture that is continue to be useful and meaningful to its occupant. Um, so that's, um, and then along with that, we came up with a guideline, a two-volume guideline, um, that to uh, advise the uh, both professional site managers and also for homeowners, um, you know, instructions on how they can maintain and repair the courtyard houses, house and things that is, you know, can be recommended to do and some not to. So this is a partnership with UNESCO Beijing and with Shanghai Tongji University and with the uh, municipality. Mm, and then so this program actually got the Award of Merit from UNESCO Asia Pacific for Cultural Heritage Conservation in 2015. Um, I'm not going to read everything here, but one of the things that they actually commented is that it's, it's, a, it's a wide ranging partnership, you know, that they say that involves authorities, national experts and international heritage organizations to enable homeowners. So this is really um, that the whole the whole beauty of this program or the success of it is that you know it, it really kind of involves different stakeholders and, and coming together to uh, come up with a system of finance a finance model to uh, so that to enable homeowners that they can still have some autonomy to make decisions about their own uh, restoration of their own property. Um, so this is, I'm not going to go through everything. This is some of the partnership and some of the uh, uh, summary of the achievement that we have done. Um, so that's the second project. Sorry, I'm rushing through because I only had 20 minutes. So the second project I'm talking about is in Guizhou. So as opposed to Pingyao, this is a rural conservation project, which is a very different set of problems from urban conservation. So what is interesting about this is China has always, obviously, is, is a large a country with uh, agriculture base, and then they have always been very big on um, rural transformation, rural policy, ever since the Qing Dynasty. But the, the, the past rural policy or movement has always been focused on um, agriculture activities, land reform policy. And actually, since 2012, this is the first time, because of the pressure of rapid urbanization, for the first time, the government, central government has put heritage and, and his, his traditional villages you know, as a core mission of an, an, an approach to do rural development and transformation. So heritage is not just heritage anymore. So it makes this whole meaning of rural conservation project um, uh, uh, give it a whole new different dimension because it's very tying with development and community issues. So this is a Dali Dong project uh, village. Dong is an ethnic minority in Southwest uh, China and there's about three million of them left in China. So this village you can see, it's, it's pretty much very pristine because it's located in this valley area. So this is the core village. And around it is this terrace fields and the forest to land. So it's very isolated. Um, so this is basically how it is. So they have the uh, center of the village with architecture. And in this very hilly area, there's terrace field and then the forest to land. And then they have all their water supply coming from the spring. So, so this project has a few dimensions. So there's the ethnic minority um, policy dimension, and then it's, it's, it's not just about culture building, historic building, but it's also about their lifestyle, their, their traditional culture, their, their, their intangible uh, cultural practices, and then also this agriculture and natural environment, this cultural landscape that they're they are living in. So the, we were invited to work there because the government realized they can build infrastructure, they can build, do the hardware stuff, but then they really need an international, or not international per se, necessary, but a, 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 a NGO organization who can really work with the community as a bridge between the government and what the local um, communities want. So this is really what we are there for. So um, this is the village itself. Um, so the Dong, they are very known for the architecture. It's basically all timber architecture. And this is the drum tower that's like the center of life, um, where they have all their important meetings and where they do their festival celebration. Um, so this village is very dense. As you can see, so right now it still has 1,300 people living in it. Every house you see is, is populated. They're still building and repairing and rebuilding their house in traditional ways using timbers that, you know, they grown themselves, they own their own forested land. And, you know, when they build their houses, they have all their neighbors and friends who come and help them build it. So how do we deal with such a living community where the heritage tradition is not in the past, it's not dead? Um, 
So this is also the landscape. This is a terrace view, and you can see all this belongs to the village. So it's not just a populated area, the architecture, the, the, the landscape, the forest, they're all part of it. This is what the people rely on. This is the whole ecosystem. So, so far, we started this program in 2013. Um, and then you can see the shift. So in the beginning, uh, there was a master planning in the beginning, of, of course. And then we tried to do repair of some of the drum tower, the historic bridges, so public architecture, just to make people understand that, you know, we're trying to do the visible, uh, visible project that they can see the result of difference. And then later, we start to move on into more community-based conservation activities. So it's really telling them, because they've been living there for centuries. They don't know what's a heritage site. And then suddenly, they've been told it's become a national monument. It's become a tentative lease for war heritage site. And people like me are, are flocking in to tell them why you can't change this. So it, it's very confusing for them. Um, so we're trying to build a lot of community-based um, conservation so, see, like I'm saying, they still use the traditional way of building their own houses. Um, they have their own wood. They have the master uh, carpenter from the village. He's a farmer normally, and he just built whenever he's needed. So we've actually negotiated where usually with a conservation project of a national monument, you need a certified team from outside to perform the work. So what we've done is we've included the local villages who has you know, who are equipped with all this construction knowledge to participate as a conservation team. But then to, uh, to educate, well, to, uh, to educate, we negotiate with them on the process to say, but this is not building new. We have to use your knowledge, but to build all, which they're not used to. So it's a very interesting um, learning process for both, for both parties. Um, so this is then repairing one of the historic granaries. Um, this is then repairing their drum tower. And then there were certain things that we have to make compromise because they talk about the drum tower. Uh, they don't want, they want to add in some non-structural changes to improve it so that they would like to use it. It's better to use in the winter. So we did a special negotiation with the government, cultural department, and we got experts to review it. And they were like, it's okay, as long as it's non-structural, this is a living heritage site, we're not going to make them live in a monument. So they got the changes that they want and they've been practicing their song during the winter. Um, so it's, it's actually bring to life the spaces through the restoration project. And then there's other projects where the traditional water system um, is also very much part of it. It's not just the architecture. They still drink all their water from six historic well uh, in the village. So we've uh, worked with um, landscape architects and, and, and the environment departments on cleaning up some of the water ponds, restoring some of the drainage system in the village. And then, we, we like, and then we're doing some community program. For instance, we're working with the women. The Dong women, they're very known for their textile. So they grow their own cotton, they weave, they weave their own textile, and then they grow their own indigo to dye it blue. So the, the blue Dong textile is very popular. Um, and they're known for it. So now we brought in, uh, we're working with some designers from Beijing, and we, we bought textile from this woman, and they're teaching them to uh, try to experiment with some new products. So for those of you who might be in Beijing next week, we're opening a, a, a Beijing Design Week on this Friday, 23rd to October 1st, where we have um, some of the women from the village, they're going to be there, and they will be demonstrating what they do, and they'll be selling some of the products that um, they've developed. Um, so this is some, some of the things that are in progress. This is their whole indi the natural indigo traditional dye. Um, and then so everything that we do, basically, so it's a, it's a, it's a very... It's a complicated process because unlike other monumental projects that we've done, we just need to negotiate with the government cultural bureau and then we get an agreement. So here, every process, everything that we do, we have to consult with the community. Um, they have the tradition of the elders. So every, every conservation meeting, we, held, we have to ask their opinion, we have to see if they support us, and we have to explain to them. So, so it's, it's very much a participation, you know, engagement process. Um, so... Um, wrap up with the last project that I will talk briefly about. So this is my Jishan Cave Temple in Gansu. Um, this is a new project that GHF is looking at investigation. So what is interesting about this, this is actually a cave temple um, in, uh, along the Silk Road. So this is actually also inscribed as a World Heritage Site on, in 2014 as part of the Silk Road nomination. So this is my Jishan. So it, it's very different. So you would say this is monumental, right? But what is different about Maji Shan is it's actually located in a, a great national park, uh, what we call Fengjing Mingshen Chu. And inside the whole park, the conservation area, there's uh, about two to 3,000 um, villagers who still live in an immediate area. Um, so, and then also the, 
beauty about Mai Jishan, other than the beautiful sculpture, which I'll show you later, is this whole natural context around it. So it's also a cultural landscape. So the value itself is not just in the cave temple, the grottoes. Um, so to just show you where it is, this is the whole circle nomination. So this is Mai Jishan. Uh, that's Mogao in Dunhuang. And uh, this is the whole Hexi corridor. And then Xi'an is somewhere here. Um, so this is some of the uh, sculptures in, in Mai Jishan, I said. Yeah, most of them, uh, they range from 5th to 18th century. But most of these pieces, um, like the big, this is the most, one of the most famous, um, the, the, the spans 15 meters high on the, out, uh, in, the, in the outdoor. So this is um, 6th century. Um, just a few examples. Um, a lot of them from early 6th century. The wall painting are in bad condition because unlike Mogao, which is desert environment, Majishan, I should say, is very lush. It has this whole um, natural area around it. So moisture is something that they have to deal with and have biodiversity. So, you know, animal activities is actually a big um, uh, problem for the cave, but they can't really extinct the animal because they're living inside a, a biosphere, a biopark. So this, it causes a very interesting issue. So they, it wanted, they invited GHF to be there because they wanted to, they're having an issue with visitor management. So you can see Majishan is actually, um, it's, it's this vertical cliff face, and then it's actually built with this narrow walkway that was built in the 80s. And um, they are hold, they're, they're saying that since 2011, 2015, their visitation number has doubled. And, uh, and then they, they really want to uh, learn from a uh, site, especially international site, on visitor management uh, interpretation so as to control, you know, the, uh, the visitor impact. Um, so this is what happens during May 1st. You stay in line for two hours before you can even get on to visit the site. And you see how narrow it is. And then at the tallest point, there's a vertical height of more than 80 meters. So I got seeing a lot of people who are up there getting vertical, and then they can't even like, admire the sculptures properly. So, so this is actually um, where we're going to come in and, and try to work with them, bring international experts. And then also what's interesting is they want, a, they want a, um, a, a organization like GHF also to work with the community because they still have um, immediate community right around the grotto. And they don't really understand. And to them, they just want to make money off the tourists. So they're not really educated in, in proper site management and care and conservation. So this is another area where they're very interested for us to work at. Um, so there's some of the conservation projects going on. And the other interesting thing is they actually have a lot of traditional techniques, you know, not the modern conservation science with their lab analysis. They have technicians from the local Maiji, Shan, uh, Maiji village who has worked there for 30 years as a technician. And who's still making, I don't know, 1,500 or 2,000 yuan per month. And their status, their work is not recognized. So they also like us to come in and to work with them to provide training, provide study tour, and, and, and also, you know, to encourage more local villagers to actually participate in a conservation project and to let them know, feel that they're not just a mere laborer. Their work actually has value and it actually enhances, you know, they're not just a village who lives around the grotto. They're actually part of the grotto, part of the value of it. So with that, I, can, I conclude my um, presentation. Here's Stefan. We were in the Dong village with the girls singing in their traditional costume who sing with him and fed him wine and raw fish, make him very happy. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, so next, after my presentation, um, I'd like to present uh, Ho Ying Lee. Where's Ho Ying? Yes. So Hong Yin is from the Hong Kong University. Um, I think a lot of you are actually more familiar with Hong Yin than I am. <laughs> He's quite a well-known uh, figure academic in, in, in Hong Kong, obviously. So Hong Yin is now going to talk about the uh, NGO activities in conservation in Hong Kong. So, yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you to uh, Global Heritage Fund and uh, Asia Society for having me here tonight. Um, Okay, this is, uh, I was told I have 15 minutes. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, uh, it's a big topic. Uh, it's, so, um, originally I was asked to uh, talk about uh, who are the NGOs uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong and uh, that are involved in conservation. And uh, the more I work on it, the more I realize that it's going to make a very boring uh, presentation. So instead, yeah, it's not going to work. So instead, I'm going to tell you a story and, uh, of, about Hong Kong, of uh, how we arrived uh, to today's uh, conservation situation, for better or worse. Yeah. And, uh, so, and this relates to um, 
uh, the role of NGO and uh, how NGO has played an important role in Hong Kong in advancing uh, conservation. And uh, through the concept of, uh, through the approach of public-private partnership. And, uh, okay, take one. And Hong Kong is a high-rise, high-density uh, city. And, um, I mean, needless to say, you know, it's not easy to do conservation in this kind of environment. I mean, unlike uh, what Han just presented you, China, the rest of, well, Hong Kong is part of China, the rest of China, you know, you have uh, villages, living villages, you have uh, ancient monuments, you have archaeological sites like Dun Wang. What do we have in Hong Kong? I mean, a Chinese shop house, uh, what I would call Lan Gui Tong Lao, and uh, of 70 years old, we, and you think like, wow, this is a historic building worth conserving. In China, you know, in other parts of China, we have been demolished a long time ago. But like it or not, that's all we have, you know, and uh, it's valuable to us, and, and we have to conserve it, and people want to conserve it. And uh, so in the context of uh, high-rise, high-density um, urban environment, when was the first time that the government acknowledged that there's a need to carry out urban conservation? And that was back in 1999, and uh, under our first uh, chief executive, uh, Mr. Tong. And uh, in his uh, 1999 policy address, there was one... Paragraph, okay, and that talk about urban conservation indirectly is kind of implied, okay, and but if you look carefully in this um, paragraph, it also claim in a lot of big concept, big idea, big policy that each of which can stand alone as a policy in itself, you know, and somehow that it seems to be tied to conservation uh, in the hope that the way I read it that the conservation can achieve all of this. And what do we have? Uh, besides conservation, it will also uh, sustainable development, retention of uh, urban district characters, promote tourism, and uh, redeveloping old areas. And, uh, and then somehow, I don't know why, you know, archaeological sites are thrown in, you know, in the urban environment. So did it work? Of course not, yeah. Okay. And uh, long story short, it didn't work because it's too broad a scope. It's lacking focus, and there's no proper implementation mechanism. Okay, uh, uh, let me show you. This is in 1999, and uh, seven years on, you know, and this is what happened. And uh, first of all, you know, and there was no government organization support. And uh, so from 1999 all the way to 2007, if you look at the Hong Kong government's organization chart, you look high and low, left and right, and you look for one agency, government agency that has direct responsibility, clear and direct responsibility in conservation. Can you find it? No, you can't find it. And why, you know? Because that agency is a little office, okay? Antiquities and Monuments Office that's hidden away in a department uh, called the Leisure and Cultural Services Department, which is a department that deal with uh, facilities management. They manage museum, they manage parks, they manage uh, sports facilities. So they are not an agency that develop uh, and advance uh, conservation per se. And, and this agency, uh, this office, you know, is tucked away in the department, is under the Home Affairs uh, Bureau. And uh, and this bureau has no technical expertise to carry out conservation. So at the time, you know, it was very difficult for our poor colleagues, you know, in the, well, friends, you know, in the Antiquities and Monuments Office, because, you know, every time they go about, they need to uh, carry out conservation since, you know, uh, the chief executive uh, really make a uh, policy statement that uh, we want to do conservation in the urban uh, environment. Then what do they do? They are all, the Antiquities and Monuments Office, they are staffed by uh, historians, um, uh, art curators, museum curators, archaeologists, anthropologists, you know, so they have no technical expertise to carry out uh, conservation work. And so they have to borrow expertise elsewhere, so from another bureau, for example, the architectural services. Okay? And uh, so that means, you know, there's uh, a lot of red tape to go through. So you have to ask uh, the office, we have to ask the uh, department director, who will have to ask uh, the bureau secretary, and the bureau secretary will have to ask the other bureau secretary who have to order, you know, a department director and who will have to uh, find, you know, a section chief, you know, section head, you know, to see whether you, the section head, you know, this architect is free or willing to help another, uh, help uh, 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 in a conservation project that belongs to another bureau. You know. So 
if I were that person asked, you know, if I have a choice, what would I say? Of course, no. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a Cantonese saying, you know, so, you know, the least you do, the least you screw up, you know. So it's not my problem in the first place. Why would I want to take on this responsibility? If I screw up, then uh, my career will be jeopardized, you know. So there's this problem. And uh, so that leads to the public perception that uh, why, you know, at the time, you know, conservation and uh, the department between agency, between agency, they don't seem to be communicating because, you know, at the time, the organizational uh, structure wasn't set out to uh, um, to uh, help with uh, cross departmental, cross agency uh, communication, and uh, and uh, okay, simple chart will show you these are all the government agency that should be involved in conservation project, but at the time, so guess what? All of this, there's no responsibility involved. They are not. Um, are required to do any conservation uh, work, you know, except and uh, the only agency that is required to carry out conservation work, or rather they are tasked with the responsibility of carrying out conservation work is Antiquities and Monument Office within the Leisure and Cultural Services Department, uh, whose responsibility are parks, sports facilities, museum, and conservation is actually part of the museum component. And, and Besides the government, and what about the public? And uh, because Hong Kong public has been, um, for so many years, has been put under the, uh, uh, been put to the understanding that conservation is all about ancient monument, looking at China, about archaeological site, about buildings, you know, the hundreds of years old, you know, and uh, important, um, I mean, really historic buildings, you know. And but Hong Kong, what do we have, you know, and we have very uh, few, you know, of such buildings. Uh, buildings of such quality and also conservation for what? That's the bigger question. So earlier Han presented the project. It's a living village. You conserve the village. You are, you are preserved. You are actually sustaining the community. So there's a good cause in it. But what about Hong Kong? We have a building that are less than 100 years old. They're a nice building uh, within Hong Kong. And, uh, and the perception at the time is that uh, they are good for two things. One is a museum. Okay, and uh, second, it's good for making money. Well, Hong Kong is always about making money. We are the only culture in the world uh, uh, that uh, greets people during the new year by saying that may you make lots of money. That's what Kung Hee Fa Choi means. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so <laughs> the other option is uh, to uh, use it for tourism promotion and uh, especially high-end tourist consumption. And both leads to problem. And the museum, you know, is a money training thing heavily and uh, also museum if you try to squeeze a museum into a um, heritage building a small heritage building is going to cause a lot of problem um, especially you know and in terms of its uh, sustainable uh, operation and uh, financially speaking and uh, for the other option uh, tourism and uh, that lead to a lot of uh, public uh, dissatisfaction that uh, why are we the question about why are we giving away our heritage to tourists you know and also why are we um, and this is uh, uh, so. How is this uh, benefiting us, you know, as Hong Kongers? So, you know, I like to use this as an example because I, I tell people, even though I make a good salary as a as a professor at the university, and uh, yet, you know, I would, with my salary, I would never, uh, I would never buy anything or use the service from here. Why? Because I don't need it. Second, I can't afford it. Okay, that's the reality. And uh, and then also, you know, at the time, you know, this is. Uh, uh, soon after the handover with uh, the new generation, the so-called uh, post-80 generation, uh, younger people who were born in the 1980s and, and later, you know, and they start to uh, have a different kind of uh, idea about uh, how Hong Kong should be, um, should be uh, developed. And uh, so conservation versus developers' interest became a, uh, a big issue because with my parents' generation, and uh, they would think that making money is the most important thing. You know, having food on the table and a roof over the head, uh, that's the priority. Anything else, forget it. Okay, it's not important. But Hong Kong has reached a level, uh, a certain education standard and uh, economic um, level that the younger generation is starting to think about um, higher things, you know, not just uh, survival needs, you know. And so that's why we see this phenomenon in uh, soon after the handover that uh, uh, people start questioning the the developers' um, uh, 
excuse, okay, I'm, thinking, I'm trying to think of a more polite word, okay, that uh, we need to develop and uh, otherwise uh, Hong Kong uh, would die, you know. But then you have to ask, you know, okay, yes, you know, Hong Kong, the developer's interest, I mean, it seems that the, I mean, the younger generation is starting to question and say, wait a minute, you know, I mean, there's a difference between the developer's short-term financial gain and the Hong Kong's long-term development interest. There are two separate things. You're trying to confuse the two and, and you expect me, expect us to believe it. So they're not buying into that argument anymore. So you see, for example, Li Tong Street, a case in point, protest after protest, and even the, after the everything along the street, all the buildings along the street were demolished and still, you know, there were people protesting. And uh, so, and all this, um, the, I would say, conflict between generations and uh, came to a head in uh, one incident, the so-called uh, Star Ferry Pier and Queen's Pier incident. And uh, to call it an incident, that means this is pretty serious. And uh, it was the demolition of uh, a ferry pier, which is architecturally not very remarkable. In fact, not remarkable at all. You know, historically, well, it was built in the 50s. You know, and uh, no matter how you look at it, uh, and, uh, it would be very tough you know, to uh, try to uh, um, uh, find historical meaning uh, from it. So, but it was demolished, but the, and people seem to like it. You know, and then the night, the day, the night uh, when it was due to demolish, and uh, to everyone's surprise, you know, mm. that the street erupted into protest. You know, and uh, it started off quite mildly, people coming to the street, or rather to the building, and put up uh, slogans you know, to say that uh, it's wrong to tear down the Star Ferry Pier, and then there's some more word here, you know, something, something, or I think it's um, uh, please stop now or something. You know. and, uh, and then the, the, the whole protest start to escalate, you know, and uh, soon it start to uh, spin out control. When you have people willing to risk life and limb to stop a demolition of building, you know, well, Houston, we have a problem. You know. And uh, yep. And this is uh, eventually lead to this uh, this confrontation. It was uh, one of the fiercest public protests, you know, after the handover. And uh, well, that's until 2014. Uh, we have another even even more fierce one. Uh, okay, so you can see, you know, from newspaper headline of how serious the situation was, you know, and it also uh, pointed out, you know, this uh, changing. Uh, societal expectation in um, in conservation and uh, the government is not simply not simply not meeting meeting these uh, expectations yeah. and uh, so this is uh, the protest you know, all the headlines you know, activists are being trained you know, to how to handle uh, 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 the protest you know, in case they are uh, they are uh, they are cleared by the police you know. And uh, and in the end, you know, and uh, it led to a direct confrontation between the activists and the police, you know, and uh, and one of them, you know, one of these protesters, they, he chained himself to a building, and this is something amazing. I mean, this is historic because never in Hong Kong has people willing to chain themselves, risk their life, limb, life and limb, you know, to try to protect a unremarkable building. <laughs> So something has to give, you know, so, and it gave. You know, and so take two. Uh, <laughs> lucky for conservationists, for conservation, I should say, Hong Kong's conservation, is that this uh, happened in, at a very awkward moment for our second chief executive. He was ready to um, assume his uh, second term of office, and he thought it would be a cakewalk, a walkover, you know. And then suddenly this thing, this uh, protest, Star Ferry Pier, Queen's Pier thing, you know, start to blow up in his face, you know. So, but... He's facing a crisis, but it also created for him an opportunity. And within nine months, wow, this is a, this is a, a remarkable achievement. Nine months in his, uh, okay, the Queen's Pier was teared down, was torn down uh, in early 2007. And in October 2007, just nine months, in his policy address, he came out with a comprehensive, he announced a comprehensive conservation policy, the first ever in Hong Kong. Okay, eight paragraph long, longest ever. You know, normally it's one sentence, okay, and uh, usually it's uh, packed to a lot of uh, other 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 things. You know, and uh, and it's a, not a bad policy at all. You know, because in the first sentence, the uh, first paragraph, you talk about conservation for what, and you talk about conservation for cultural life, you know, about having a quality city life, about living experience. It's about lifestyle. Not bad at all. This is a good starting point instead of about fabric conservation for conservation's sake, conservation about for the past as museum, you know, and or conservation for other people as for tourists, you know. So no, 
it's about us. And uh, so this is a good start. And uh, at the time, you know, and the day before um, the, the, this uh, uh, policy address, the South China Morning Post, you know, the, uh, the reporter, they, they, um, they, um, they got wind of the, that uh, this, uh, they knew, learned about that uh, this coming policy and uh, would have a long, um, uh, a major part on uh, conservation. So they asked me to uh, stand by and write a commentary as soon as the policy address was announced. You know. And uh, so I wrote this piece, you know, and uh, this is the key point. And I wrote, conservation in the context of a living city, Hong Kong is a living city, should be less about preserving individual buildings as state monuments. Instead, it should be more about the living heritage of established community that give Hong Kong urban experience such enchanting qualities. Why do we, why do people like Hong Kong? It's not about its museum, and increasingly, it's no longer no longer about its shopping mall. You know, it's really about um, how would I put it? Uh, those of you who are sci-fi geeks like like I am, okay, and uh, Ghost in the Shell, okay, the background, uh, you know, the story is set. It's a, supposed to be a futuristic city, but it's based on uh, today's Hong Kong. Uh, this is going to be made into a live action movie uh, and uh, watch out for it. And that's how exciting Hong Kong is. It's a unique city. It's one of a kind. You can never find a city like Hong Kong anywhere else in the world. And uh, that's the attraction. And so, so to use some um, uh, to paraphrase, you know, a term made famous by Bill Clinton, you know, what's Hong Kong's conservation? It's about the people, stupid. Okay. Okay. It's not about the fabric. And so, but this time the government seems to show uh, political will, you know, and by reforming the government structure, and you look at from since 1st July 2007, and uh, you find that almost most of the major government agencies that uh, should, be should be involved in conservation projects were placed under a new bureau called the Development Bureau. So include, uh, let me read it out to you, uh, this is Development Bureau, Architectural Services, uh, buildings, uh, civil engineering, drainage, and this is um, electrical, mechanical services, uh, lands, okay, this is important, land registry, planning, okay, planning is very important, and uh, water supply, okay, so we are planning, we have uh, architectural services, we are building, we have civil engineering, okay, so these are the key, all the key players that should be involved in conservation in place under one boss, so there's no argument between a sectory, between bureaus. Okay, so that means one boss she gives the order, happen to be Carrie Lamb and uh, bless her heart, and uh, and everybody would just have to uh, snap to it. And uh, so you can see that previously in this chart, all these government agencies that should be involved in conservation work previously, nope, there's only the Ar Antiquities and Monuments Office. But with this government uh, restructuring, and now you see that almost. Well, a lot of the almost vast majority of these uh, government agencies now, you know, have uh, responsibility in uh, conservation to varying degree. So it's a very positive change. And uh, and what about? Uh, okay, so how do you show political will? Well, the simplest way to show political will is show me the money. And this time, the government is showing us the money. So one billion dollars was uh, set aside for creative. Conservation. What is creative conservation? And later, this has been rolled into uh, over three billion, and uh, and uh, and this is money from uh, from a fund. I can't remember the name. I think it's Capital Work Fund, and this is money generated from land sales, you know? and uh, so it's a lot of money in there. So and uh, and this is what is meant by creative uh, conservation. And uh, later. Uh, the creative conservation idea was formalized into the revitalizing historic buildings through partnership scheme. This is a typical uh, government um, title. It's too long uh, that nobody can remember. So everybody shorten it to revitalization scheme or simply R scheme. Okay, and what does this uh, do? You know, and uh, this is the brochure for the R scheme, and uh, this is what it does. You know, say through good adaptive reuse of our historic buildings, we aim to give this building a new lease of life for the enjoyment of the public, okay, it's for the public, for reuse, and the key word here is use, okay, reuse, that means this time, you know, conservation is no longer tre being treated as a, a monument, as an artifact, as an object, but rather as an urban asset to be reused, and this ties very much to the concept of sustainable development, yeah. and um, so if you look at the, the briefing 
document to our legislative council back in 2009. And uh, who are the people um, uh, eligible to apply uh, for this uh, scheme as operator for this uh, historic building. And all of these buildings are owned by the government. Okay, in Hong Kong, to date, okay, uh, Global Heritage Fund might want to date, no. If you want to collaborate um, with a um, partner, you must always go with the government. Forget about private, uh, um, private owners. They will never, because the, there's so much financial, uh, so much money at stake, you know, they will never collaborate with you. It's uh, how to conserve a private, privately owned property, you know, is a major issue in Hong Kong that uh, no one seems to have, have found a solution yet. And I don't expect it, them to find a solution in the short term. So anyway, back to uh, this briefing note, eligible of applicant, okay, and uh, social enterprise. And uh, they, this is the approach for the operation, has to be a, uh, in a social enterprise operation and uh, operated by a non-profit making, non-government organization. And, uh, and this, uh, operator, if they're successful, they have to be applied, you know, to become a charity under the Section 88 of the Linden uh, Revenue Ordinance. So what does that mean? It's a political move. Okay? It means that the government learned the lesson and see that if the public is not happy with a project and they will never support it, you need to gain the public support. And this is one good way to, to gain the public support by partnering uh, with an NGO that's non-profit and operating the, the building, you know, in, uh, as, a, as a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for the assessment of applicants, uh, of application, that means uh, NGOs and can submit proposal and to bid for the use of the building. And they're assessed uh, by four criteria, one, two, three, four. But the most important one is this, how the community, community would be benefited and with emphasis on the social value. Oh, this is the first time and uh, we see this you know, in Hong Kong that they talk about not society at large, you know, not something very abstract, but something very uh, precise you know, and focused that the benefit must go to the community around the building. Okay, and so examples, okay, I'm running out of time. Okay, I should stop, you know. So what are the few examples that we have completed so far. We are right at the beginning of this uh, revitalization scheme. It's an experimental project, this, and the project that will be completed or have completed and will be completed soon are all pilot schemes you know, to demonstrate a, um, um, an idea and, uh, and to achieve an outcome, which is how conservation can benefit Hong Kong's public. And, uh, and by doing so, it can gain the public support. You know, okay? and, and, where we are now, you know, uh, Asia Society, um, this is a very good example. And um, so this is uh, where we are now, is Asia Society's Hong Kong Center. And uh, this is taken directly from the website. And, uh, and it's, it's part, it partners with, okay, Asia Society is an NGO. But NGO, the conservation in Hong Kong especially, you always ask the question, like, where is the money from? Okay, where do you get the money from? Where's the funding from? And Asia Society because it's so well connected. And uh, so the Hong Kong Jockey Club, okay, this is a good partner, okay. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charity Trust. Yeah. And so that in Hong Kong, it's important to have a project that are, um, how would I put it, that, are, that can showcase, you know, that conservation can work. And so, and that means, you know, you need project that can show not only to Hong Kong, to the world, you know, that uh, we can do it well and, uh, and this is, uh, and can be sustained. And, uh, and uh, because, you know, if we spend, um, if we spend, if we, if we divide the limited amount of resources to do only little project, and that's not going to make an impact in the long run. And very soon people is going to lose interest because and uh, all and developers who has got the uh, financial uh, interest elsewhere, you know, they would they can claim they say, look, you know, this is what they can do in conservation. Is it relevant to Hong Kong? How is it benefiting Hong Kong? So that's as a strategy, it's not going to work. So as a strategy, as a better strategy, we need projects that can impress people, not only impress the local people, but impress the world. Hopefully, okay. And uh, so that's why, you know, we have, uh, we have this uh, Asia Society Hong Kong Center project. It's not a bad project. It's very good. You know? I mean, architecturally speaking, you know, this is reported in, the, in a lot of architectural journal. You know? OK, 
Okay, and uh, another project um, that's uh, more local based, you know, and this is uh, um, a project collaborated uh, between the Hong Kong Arts Center and the Urban Renewal Authority. And Urban Renewal Authority, they have money, so it's a good partner. Yeah. And uh, so this is uh, the building in question, actually two rows, two rows of these uh, shop houses. And uh, this is the result, and uh, it's public space, and um, and uh, shops are catered not to uh, not to uh, uh, not to uh, expensive shops and you know, expensive businesses or branded um, uh, businesses, you know, that but just local shops, you know, neighborhood shops, and um, and more importantly, it is it caters to it's a these uh, houses facilities for local comic and animation artists. So it's part of the overall plan to uh, develop Hong Kong's creative industry. So. And finally, and uh, this is another major project that's upcoming, and hopefully we can. This can be opened in 2017, and uh, this is uh, the revitalization of uh, the former Central Police Station compound, and uh, this is a cluster of old police station, courthouse, and prison buildings, and it is to be adapted as a center for heritage and uh, contemporary art. And the conservation conservation architects right there. Brian, where are you? You have to show your hand. Uh, that's the conservation architect in charge from Purcell. So very good, uh, internationally famous uh, uh, conservation consultant. I don't work for him, okay, by the way. So I have no state here. He didn't pay me money. Okay. And uh, so what does this do? You know, um, well, I say, you know, this is for heritage and uh, contemporary art promotion, but for the Hong Kong public. Uh, first, you know, and uh, and this is a partnership between the Hong Kong government and the Hong Kong Jockey Club, and funded by the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charity Trust. You know, so and this is last slide. Then let me well, because uh, uh, this Asia Society invited me here, so I have to uh, suck up to them a little bit. Eh? So I'm going to bring <laughs> close off. Uh, I'll end in this slide. And uh, so for Global Heritage Fund, so if you ask me how to start off your projects in Hong Kong. I say go for the go for the big ones. Okay. Yeah. And uh, go with the government and uh, go with Jockey Club and uh, make your name here and then you can start doing the little ones. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Please. I'm gonna invite uh, thank you. Oh, Ian, please have a seat. And um, we did not pay him for this uh, wonderful uh, plug. Thank you. But Hoeing has very much involved with uh, the conservation of uh, Asia Society Hong Kong. And now I'm going to also bring up uh, our moderator, uh, uh, Dr. Prefin Ho, also has been a great help uh, with our uh, site. He's a director uh, in, art, in architectural conservation and design program at Chinese University in Hong Kong. He's going to moderate. And then we're going to bring back Sitavan and also Kuan Yin. Uh, to, for the panel discussion. We only have uh, about 15 minutes, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ho. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Now, without losing any time, we only have 15 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to ask the questions uh, to the panelists uh, and uh, maybe open up the uh, uh, the floor to uh, question and answer within this uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I, I think uh, we talk about NGOs, and uh, I think from uh, Stefan uh, and uh, Guan Han's uh, presentation, uh, you did uh, um, bring out the aspect of uh, NGOs as an instigator, as a moderator, as well as facilitator for community participation. Uh, and that is from your perspective, uh, uh, being a, an NGO yourself, uh, bringing out uh, conservations and uh, and actually uh, moving the process of cultural and uh, social engagement. Uh, I'm I'm just uh, wondering whether that would be a model that we can uh, learn in Hong Kong or what uh, you might have in mind uh, for Hong Kong because uh, I I think in Hong Kong's NGO is a different 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 case. They are the o o opposer. They 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 would um, activists, yeah. activists. Okay, they are not NGOs. Yeah. Okay. Maybe maybe uh, you, you can shed light on. On, on uh, how uh, NGOs might uh, play this role uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I guess 
Um, because I'm not very familiar with the policy in Hong Kong, but I, I, I understand it a little bit better after Hoyin's presentation. Um, so I think what is different in, in, in China, mainland China, is because, you know, like here you have, you're activists and you, you have all these organizations where you're free to express your opinion. Um, and then so, let's just say, conservation is still very much, you know, the big project. It's the government funded. You had to work with them, but but in China, you know, NGO operation is still not as active, and and especially NGO, like I say, involved in conservation, they still pretty think much thing is a big monumental stuff. It's a government public affair. So and then also even cultural heritage bureaus in government, they're not like the most powerful compared to the Ministry of Construction, you know, development. They are pretty weak. So I, I think that's that's what's interesting is that. Um, if you tie them up with all these other, you know, heritage is not just historic building. If, if you tie them up, uh, which Hoi also touched about, is about quality of life, is about, you know, uh, reflecting the, uh, the city. So if you tie them up with all these other agenda and then, and then connecting back to the people, then, you know, it, it enhances the importance of heritage is just beyond heritage. It, it really, you know, it, you know it, it, rural, rest, rural transformation, as say inner city poverty, um, but they happen to be historic district. So I think that that's what really enhances it. So I don't know if, if such approach is applicable to Hong Kong because I feel that people are probably, you know, more vocal about it. And um, they're not as, their voices can be heard. They're more visible, as you can see. So I guess in, in mainland China, it's not as evident. The wishes of the community, it cannot be expressed as freely. So maybe the, the role of the NGO as a bridge you know, or facilitator, it's, it's probably more... Well, it's different. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank, thank you, Guang Han. So I, I promise I only ask one question. The floor is yours. Any, any questions from the floor? There's one at, uh, over there. So I, oh, hi. Uh, Sawyer Shea, Vernacular Limited. Um, so um, uh, Ms., Ms. Lee, you, you mentioned something very interesting during your talk. Uh, you said evolving vernacular. And that's something I, I want to kind of to talk to, I guess, the whole panel about. Um, you have on one end, you have adaptive reuse, where you kind of stick a glass box inside of a heritage building. And on the other end, you have, you know, uh, you know, m maybe an example from my experience is like the New York Department, uh, like Landmarks Department, where, you know, they are so stringent on what kind of windows you can use and the exact shade of paint. And, you know, like even like, you know, down to you know, the masonry has to be, you know, so precise to what it, you know, is historically documented as. So what is this evolving uh, vernacular that you, you know, that we're talking about here? And how does that, um, you know, where do you draw the line from it being adaptive reuse uh, to it being, you know, uh, you know, pure preservation? So uh, I guess it's kind of open-ended question for all of you. Um. I guess I will take that first. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, right? Like, to say, where do you draw the line? Um, so the thing is, how I think about it is, obviously, I think about it in terms of, um, maybe the easier way to think about it is, when we talk about, um, usually, monument, like archaeological site, um, what we think about it is, there's like a, a gap in history, right? So obviously, I'm not going to leave in, Versailles anymore, obviously, you know, they don't have a, they don't have a king of France anymore. So, so there's a gap of it, there's a gap in history and there's a discontinuation of its use with our current life. Whereas when I talk about the vernacular, you know, there's no, the gap is not there. You know, the people are still living in it. And a lot of these people are the ones who, 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 you know, they were descendants of the, you know, orig the original inhabitants who created that. And then the thing is, even if we look at the villages, the city, I mean, it's the same for Hong Kong or in the rural villages, they don't look the same 100 years ago, 200 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's what it is. So there's no, there's no gap in history. There's this continuation into life. So you really have to think about what does the past mean for the present? And then also, what does it mean moving forward to the future? So I think that's what I meant by evolving vernacular. But how, where do you draw the line? But I said, I think there are a lot of combination of things. I think, you know, property ownership, you have to respect that. If it's, if it's a private property ownership, you can't enforce it as a monument. And then, you know, you have to do a whole series of assessment. So I think it, it's really, it's complex. So it's a really series of 
a lot of negotiation of different stakeholders. I don't think there's a really black and white answer. But I said, if it's a, it's a monument archaeological site, it can never replicate it again. And, and that's a whole different story. So I think this is also the difficulty of um, urban conservation or rural conservation, exactly for that reason. But I think that's also what makes it so interesting because it's so complicated. Thank you. Uh, you want to add something, Stefan? I, I'll just add quickly that this is a very interesting issue and quite a complex one, and we see it in our projects ranging from uh, Pingyao in China to we have a project in Transylvania and Romania where we're actually working on a Saxon village, which is inhabited by uh, gypsy or Roma communities now. And the Saxons have left and left a long time ago, and the Roma are living in houses and desire modern amenities. They would like a toilet. They would like access to modern infrastructure. And so I think preservation needs to be understanding of that and flexible to that as well. But at the same time, as you say, you do also need regulations to ensure that certain standards are met. And so I, I like to think of it as enlightened regulation. And, and how you arrive at that process is, is a tricky one. Um, but it is, we see it in Pingyao as well. As we saw, the homeowners want to add their own decoration to a home. And I think and the experts can better answer that um, as long as the historic core of the structure is not compromised um, the, 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 and there is reversibility in the new elements that you're adding in, then I think it, 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 it works. Um, to add to uh, the... Uh, the answers, you know, from uh, you both, you know, they are good answers, you know. And I said, uh, in this boils down to the question is that, who are you conserving the buildings for? Okay, that's ultimately the question. And uh, if you are conserving the building for conservation's sake, then uh, I, I mean, personally, I find that there's a, I find a lot of problem with that. And uh, then in the end, you are, what you end up with will be a, a beautiful date building. That's of no value to anybody. Uh, rather, you know, for in the case of a vernacular architecture, and by the fact that it's vernacular means that it's a living uh, architecture. So living architecture will evolve whether you like it or not. Yeah. And what new materials they introduce today, if it's well liked and um, and uh, extensively used, you know, over time, it will become traditional. Just like a uh, corrugated metal sheet in Australia, it's a traditional material now. You know, and it used to be new, you know, and in Malaysia too. You know. So, so the, so it's um um, it's the Stefan. Sorry, <laughs> I'm having a senior moment here. Stefan say, put it rightly. Um, is that it's the core value you have to identify. You know what are the core values of uh, this uh, culture. I won't even look at the buildings, the whole culture, where in terms of its tangible elements and intangible elements that will sustain uh, this culture uh, to, and bring it to the future. And, and for me, you know, everything else can change. Okay. So I think it's as simple as that. Then because you know, by doing that, you're allowing change, you know, then you allow the, uh, this community to, uh, to uh, to uh, live a better life, you know, and that's what sustainability is all about, ultimately. Okay. Thank you. The culture will change too. Uh, we we can entertain one more question. We only have five more minutes. So one in, in the front here. Uh, at the back. Yeah, I think <clears throat> uh, the definition of heritage and conservation, I think it's very easy to visualize if you have to preserve a monument, a building. But how about some other things like the soft part of it, like a kind of lifestyle, uh, a song, a language, a uh, uh, morality practice on something, even a cuisine. So I just wonder whether N the NGO, uh, you guys are moving in that direction as well, other than just focusing on the hardware part of it. So our mission is traditionally focused on built heritage. Um, I we're adapting as we go. I, I think recently um, UNESCO has even been uh, recognizing uh, cuisines or Arab coffee, for example, was recently um, uh, registered as a, as a tradition. I think given our focus on the community, particularly indigenous communities or, or local communities that have been established around sites for a long time, um, it, it is increasingly becoming a more important focus of our work. As, as Han alluded to in Dali Village, 
um, to other communities. We have a project in Colombia and Latin America where we're working with indigenous people um, who still live around the site and use the site for religious purposes. And if you're not acknowledging and incorporating them into the built heritage preservation, um, you're going to come up, I think, short in the longer term. It's, it's something that we're learning as we go. Um, and um, you will continue to focus on it uh, in, in projects that we work in. Yeah. Um, maybe I just add a little bit to that. Um, so especially in the Guizhou project that I've, I worked on because it's an ethnic minority project, the Dong has a very distinct language and culture and traditional lifestyle. So this is, I'm trained as an architect and conservator. So I was always very material building focused. So it's actually a, a challenge for me. And, and actually one thing that I've realized, which is very interesting, is um, a few years ago, there was a, a journalist from CNN and Asia, she from Hong Kong. She came to Guizhou and she was she interested in the craft. And then she asked this question to the local cultural official. She's saying this women to this village is very famous for silversmith. And she's saying that a lot of, well, a lot of them now, they are working in the bigger city. They are selling this, you know, like ethnic jewelry. They're making a lot of money. So she's saying, so how does that, what does that mean? So that technique has been preserved, right? They're making more money in the city. So why are we preserving the village? And then so we talk about it. The thing is, if, if you do that, right, you're just preserving the technique. You're not preserving the culture and tradition. So my standpoint is if you, if you continue to maintain and improve the environment that nurture it, which is a village, because, you know, the whole, the, the craft, the embroidery, the textile, it's not just a piece. So it means something when they wear a certain costume because it relates to the festival. It relates to where they do the song. It relates to when, you know, the, the wood that they use to make the instrument it came from where it is. So if you maintain the built environment of where it nurtures it, you know, they will continue to evolve and continue to grow. So the tradition is not stuck in history. They will continue to have new tradition, but it's grow grown from that same culture. But if you place in the city, you can still create beautiful craft, but it's just technique, and it would not evolve in that same sense. So that's how I see the value of preserving a built environment in the living community and in, in, in a relationship to this, you know, intangible craft that, that we talk about. Um. Maybe I have a last word, uh, my contribution to your question. Uh, I, I chair the Lord Wilson Heritage Trust in Hong Kong. And the last uh, four years, uh, we concentrate on uh, intangible heritage. So we support uh, uh, research, the preservation of uh, intangible uh, uh, her uh, heritage or activities uh, in Hong Kong, including uh, singing songs uh, during someone's uh, funeral, which is a dying, dying trade. And uh, so how to preserve that song singing and the uh, lyrics. And, uh, and it's actually quite interesting because when we support this uh, particular activities, a lot of people wanted to learn. So it's sort of reviving that kind of activities, not uh, maybe for pleasure, but not for actual singing at the funeral. And so uh, it's something that we are trying to do in Hong Kong as well. And um, so um, that's the uh, last question. But of course, uh, the speakers are going to be around, so you can ask them questions uh, later on after the uh, meeting is over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dr. Ho. We really appreciate it. We're going to uh, really, all your advice uh, in the past have been wonderful. And same thing um, with uh, Hoi and thank you both. And Stefan, we hope to have you back. And, uh, and we're really delighted to be working with uh, Global Heritage Fund. And uh, I think, Kwan Han, thank you for a great pres uh, pres uh, presentation about China. And I just want to let you know, we actually had the Dong singers here in this room about uh, they were doing the drinking song with us. Uh, and they were with us about a year ago um, uh, when we had a museum summit and they flew in. We flew them in from uh, uh, from where they were. And so this is what's so great about this site and, and, and the um, Asia Society. We're delighted to be able to partner and work with uh, wonderful uh, practitioners and we look forward to uh, further collaboration. And on behalf of Asia Society, small token of our appreciation. Thank <laughs> you.